You're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming on iTunes, Google Podcasts, and at DCAUReview.com. Now, here's today's episode. Welcome, everybody, to episode 74 of the DCAU Review. I am Liam. With me, as always, is Cal. Cal, we got a brand new month, a brand new show, well, not a brand new show, we've done it before, but a new show. We moved on from Static Shock, and we are back in the world of the Man of Steel. That's right, we are traveling all the way to Metropolis, we spent some time in Dakota, we spent some time in futuristic Gotham, Yep. we're back in, uh, in, in it's a stately, bright, and bushy-tailed Metropolis. <laughs> it's a more optimistic city, as we'll get into in this episode. We are covering the episode Prototype this week, um, and we will get into Cal's thoughts on the plot here in just a second, but as always... I do have the official IMDb synopsis for this episode. Super excited about that, Liam. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so this is for the episode Prototype, as mentioned, written by Hilary J. Bader, directed by Kurt Gaeta. And the synopsis reads as such. As inventor John Henry Irons fears, the pilot of his imperfect prototype power armor becomes violently unstable. Which, uh, yeah, that's... They're usually pretty good with these. Yeah, you yeah. This describes it pretty well. There's been a couple that were like, really, that's it. But yeah, yeah, but I guess what are what are your thoughts here on the big picture plot? Basically, we introduce that Lex Luthor has invented or created this new power armor. His idea is that all cops in Metropolis will be wearing these, uh, but this prototype stage that's invented by John Henry Irons, uh, and then things sort of go awry from there. Yeah, we uh, we learn pretty quickly that uh, this is. Lex, Lex, of course, the likes to portray himself as a humanitarian. Of course, this is him helping out Metropolis as a city to give Superman a break. Right. Lois, Lois immediately assumes that he's trying to put the Man of Steel out of business, but we all know that Lex being Lex, it's about money. He's going to milk the city dry, selling these super suits to them, and, uh, of course, uh, obtain personal glory because he's the person that invented the suit, or his company did at least as we'll learn as we go further in the story but yeah i think that this is a fun little episode it's uh not one i think it's one that i feel like we had seen and we, we talk about that a lot because of the limited amount of superman episodes and the seasons were shorter than the first couple seasons of batman the animated series yeah these episodes get played, got played a lot over and over and over again. So I do mm-hmm. remember seeing this one a, a fair amount, but there were some things in it that I I didn't rec- recall at the time. I um, I really enjoyed it. I think the the idea of having introducing this suit that of course later on and uh, is used by John Henry Irons, who also makes his first appearance in this episode. So, of course, John Henry Irons was introduced during the Man of Steel, or the uh, the Doomsday storyline, rather, Death of Superman yes. storyline, Reign of the Superman. He came in and was introduced as, as this character, gained popularity in the mid-'90s. Of course, Shaq played him in a movie <laughs> that nobody likes to remember. Right. Um, but that, that was put out there, there was toys, there was a a lot of stuff put behind that movie. So you have this introduction of this character who, other than Superboy, well, I guess they all stuck around, Cyborg, Superman, and Eradicator, but I feel like Steel and Superboy made the most impact because they're the superheroes, I guess. Definitely. So they, they made the most impact as far as hanging around after that Reign of Superman story ended. But, of course, we have the introduction of John Henry Irons, who eventually becomes Steel. This is the suit that he eventually modifies and uses to become Steel. And, of course, he plays a, a, a small role going forward in the DCAU. He's, he makes some follow-up appearances in Justice League Unlimited, as we will see once we tackle some of those episodes. But I really I really enjoy that. And it's a story of man and machine melding to become one, essentially. We have a guy who's getting addicted to the power. He starts out... You know, being Superman's pal, if you will, yeah. and he's out there helping helping Superman save people from a burning building. But it quickly goes awry as this 
suit in him, he sort of gets addicted to the power, and uh, that in and of itself isn't necessarily a, a original story. The man in the machine, you know, he, he gets addicted to this, and Superman has to stop him before he gets out of control. Seems to be a, a familiar trope, as it were. So it's, a, you know, it doesn't necessarily get a high grade for originality, but I think the way they pulled it off, I think that they made him a formidable opponent for Superman. They kind of had to, you know, re- jerry rig some things by having Superman get shot in the face by his right. black light lasers, but in order for it to be a, an even match. But even before Superman gets shot, you can see that it's, that it seems to be with his suit's enhancement, you know, he's. T- he has flight, he has the strength of 10 men or whatever it was, or 20, 10 times the, the normal strength of a human, human man. So it, he's a formidable foe for Superman. There's some fun battling between the two of them that takes place and a violent end. Yes, definitely. And one of the things, and we, we talked about this a little bit before, right before we started recording, that I liked about the, the way the story plays out um, is this guy, when he first shows up, there's a fire... Uh, right after Lex is sort of showing off the suit. So this guy goes to help, and of course Superman's there, and Superman's reaction is not to immediately be, like, suspicious or jealous or anything. He's like, hey, cool, new guy help to help me, uh, you know, save the day. And I I think that speaks to, it's a good way of showing off the more optimistic version of this, whereas a character like Batman would have been probably instantly suspicious, especially because it's a Lex Luthor production that we're dealing with here. Um, and you could say maybe that makes him a little bit naive, but I think he trusts more in the individual here, in this Sergeant Mills, that he is a good guy who just wants to do a good thing. And so he, he sort of, Superman sort of, uh, you know, sees him as an ally at first, and then as he sees him become more and more violent as the episode goes on, he has to finally kind of confront him and and deal with him physically. But I thought that was a nice little, just a little twist there, is to have Superman sort of always wanting to see the best in everyone, even in someone who's been granted this special suit by uh, by Lex. And it is mentioned in the dialogue throughout the episode that, uh, that John Henry Irons had doubts about it, like he didn't feel that it was ready to be worn, to be shown off to the public. And obviously his concerns were were validated as uh, Sergeant Mills kind of gets more and more violent and unhinged. Uh, Maggie Sawyer bans him from wearing the suit and puts him on leave. And then he somehow, although it is not quite clear how, breaks into the... Snuck uh, past high security. Yes, and then uh, makes a Looney Tunes-style uh, body-shaped hole to get out of the building. But we're not sure how he got in. Um, but he steals the suit back and kind of goes after Lex. Lex, of course, because he's Lex, betrays him immediately. I love that. It's such it's such the character of Lex. Lex he he goes to fly into Lex and, and to meet up with Lex because he knows that Lex is sort of his ally in this. That Lex created the suit and Lex pseudo pretends to be a, a comforter of sorts and he's going to make everything better and everything will be okay. As long as as he's around, because he's Lex and he cares right. for him. Meanwhile, he turns his back and he has Lex is the only person with a kill switch. He jams this kill, literally stabs him in the back <laughs> by jamming this kill switch into the the back of of the suit and uh, nearly kills him there. If if only he hadn't fallen on the uh, the device itself yeah. and crushed it when he fell, Lex may have been the person that had uh, deactivated the suit, but. Yeah, it's 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 good. It's you have a lot of a lot of good good Lex and uh, Lex dialogue there. You you have, yeah. It's I, I think the story flows very well also, and I think that um, I think they do a good job. Of, like I said, of making this guy a formidable opponent to Superman for just being a guy in a suit. You know. Yeah, definitely. Um, your Cree, obviously, as you mentioned, we're using some existing characters from the comics, and we have Lex as the background. But this character, the central focus of the episode, is a, a brand new character, and they did a, a good job of sort of establishing that he's just, like, a good guy who wants to help, who then is sort of overwhelmed by this power, and uh, you see it at the end of the episode, they kind of explain that, you know, he's in the hospital, and his wife's kind of, you know, standing by his side, and so you kind of get, it's not quite a super happy ending, but then you kind of get the wink and the nod that we might see a version of this suit again one day, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, But yeah, I guess we can get into scores here. I gave Plot 7 out of 10. I think it's a good, strong episode because of everything we've talked about, because of the Lex factor of this episode. 
Um, I and we'll talk about it more in visuals, but I enjoyed the way the fights between Superman, as you mentioned, uh, he Superman stops him by basically pulling out two power lines and first just holding them and electrifying himself and Mills at the same time so that Mills will let go of him and then jamming the uh, the the wires into uh, Mills's suit and just frying his. Frying him and his brain, maybe a little bit. I think it was. I guess it was supposed to be him separating from the suit. Yeah, the two of them separating. You know, sort of. I don't know, but you get an up close visuals. We'll talk about of his eyeball and stuff. But yeah, yeah. So I, I actually gave it a, the exact same score of seven out of ten. I, I again, we we don't discuss our scores before Correct. going on the air, but seven out of ten. I think. Yeah, it's a good fun episode. Yeah, agreed. And moving on here to music, I don't have a ton of thoughts on music in this episode, Cal. I think they do some interesting things in the fight scenes towards the end. There's a lot of percussion, uh, like conga drums and stuff like that, and some weird like piano music. The piano reminds me a lot of the Bizarro episode, actually, hmm. which, of course, you can find in the archives at DCAUReview.com. But, yeah, it reminds me of that set sort of like... What's going on? This is weird. Because as the transformation of Bizarro happens, they play yes. that out-of-tune piano chord type, yeah. s- type soundtrack. And there are spots in this where it sounds very similar to me. That's, that's a good point. And yeah, other than that, we get some sort of you know generic, heroic music. We hear the Superman theme a few times, and um, which is always good. It's always, you know, feels triumphant when it when it gets played, when, he, when Superman's ready to make his comeback and start... Uh, you know, taking the fight to the villain here. So I I just gave music 5 out of 10, kind of middle of the road. I didn't think anything was offensive, but I didn't think anything really stood out to me as great either. <laughs> uh, I concur. You get an awkward placement of the Superman theme as he's rescuing the people from the burning building, the very first scene. And it's yeah. not when he flies in. It's when he's descending, holding the rock were part of the roof that yeah. has the people on it. It was an odd choice to play for that to be when the Superman theme comes in. Other than that, yeah, I, I don't think there was anything that was spectacular in the episode, but nothing that was uh, that stood out as being super awkward or, or weird. So, again, I gave it the same exact score, 5 out of 10. Well, there we go. Moving right along to visuals and animation. Um, I guess the biggest thing to talk about, as we talked about, we have this new villain his design is very reminiscent of RoboCop, yes. um, in the sense that it's a you know like a silverish, whitish armor with a big black like blast shield over his eyes. Um, but he has a lot of cool weapons and stuff too. I liked the way they visualized his. Uh, I believe that this guy could be a match for Superman in this suit. Yeah, I agree. It, it, he's he's it's body armor. You can see it comes off at the very end when Superman is removing him from the comes off piece by. F- piece and it sounds very heavy when he throws it off it's not just plexiglass or some, yeah. some thin thin metal material it sounds very heavy and of course you have the, the different features of it the the finger lasers were, were a nice touch yeah those are cool weapons uh he has uh jet pack they say jet pack but the jets come out of his his boots so. right Jet boots, jet pants. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> jet feet. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. So yeah, visually, it, it's it fits in with what you see for the. It's supposed to be a part of the MC, the MCU. SCU. Or, or, I'm sorry, not the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Right. The, the uh, Special Crimes Unit. The Special Crimes Unit for the Metropolis Police Department. Uh, so you have you have it fit in visually with those guys that have the black face shield mm-hmm. that, and the body armor that most of the Metropolis Police Department seems to wear. But it stands out because it is unique and different and has its own sort of features to it. Uh, one of the things I did not like about visuals for this episode, you mentioned it briefly when we were discussing the plot, is the Looney Tune-esque sort of cartoon <laughs> things that they did in this episode. As you mentioned, there's the one scene where the, he breaks out using the suit and he leaves very wily Coyote with the complete outline of his body walking through the wall. Yeah. Uh, not very realistic. Then you have, he's battling Superman in the scene where the shark gets broken out of Superman 
uh, Lex's shark tank. Right. And he slams Superman's face through, uh, almost through the elevator door, and it makes the complete outline of Superman's face as if a la Looney yeah. Tunes. So yeah. Now, Bugs Bunny's face or, you know... Yosemite Sam's face coming through a wall. Right. It was a little too cartoony and goofy for me. Yes, this is a cartoon. Yes, it's a children's cartoon. But that's over the top and, and yeah, was completely unnecessary. So I took, it actually took my score down just a small tick. With that being said, though, I, I did not hate the animation and visuals. I think it was a nice, refreshing. Uh, breath of fresh air to go back <laughs> to the DCAU style after see, after a couple weeks in that original first season of Static Shock that wasn't maybe not so great. So yeah. uh, I, I gave the score 7 out of 10. What about you? <laughs> uh we going 3 for 3? I think we're going 3 for 3 here as I also gave visuals a 7 out of 10. Yeah, I liked, like I said, all the weapons you mentioned, the, the finger lasers, the grenade launchers and stuff. Um, it's sort of like this almost like, yeah, this prototype Iron Man type suit. Um, I, I liked, uh, yeah, I, I liked that. I liked the fight that they had. He, as you mentioned, he blasts Superman in the eyes with his lasers, and then Superman can't see for most of their fight. He's got scorched skin. Yeah, he's got, like, his eyes, it's all black around his eyes, and his, they, they, a couple times they show, like, a POV, and you just see, like, you know, stars and bright pink lights coming, and it's, so they really establish that he really can't see at all. And they actually do a cool shot of, like, he, they show his eyelid closing, and then they use that as, like, a transition to the next part of the scene. So I thought they did some pretty creative stuff with that POV stuff, and there's a shot as his vision returns right at the end of the episode where he sees the high-voltage area where he pulls the wires out and uh, <laughs> jams them into the suit and uh, fries both himself and uh, and Sergeant Mills here to, to free free him of his connection. As you mentioned, there's a shot, of, a very close-up shot of uh, Mills' eyes, and you see the pupil just leave his eyes, yeah, uh, and his, then it's just like a bl- blank blue, uh, blue circle, and you're like, is he supposed to be blind now? We're not exactly sure, but uh, and that they don't they don't mention that, but and some other minor things like uh, it was for story purposes. But when we first see Sergeant Mills, he has like blonde, like military style flat top, and then uh, th- the deeper he gets in with this suit, the he shaves his head and. Um, I think they did a good job, uh, both visually and story-wise, of kind of showing his sort of slower descent into uh, madness a little bit, and I thought that uh, that did a good job there. But yes, for the third straight category, we do have the same score of 7 out of 10. And then that will bring us to our final category, that being voice acting. We got a lot of guest players this week. We have uh, Michael Dorn as John Henry Irons, who uh, listeners would know as Calabac. Yeah. Uh, as well as he was on he was on Star Trek back in the day, but yeah, as far as DCAU uh, properties go, he was the voice of Calabac. I was impressed because I did not immediately recognize him as Calabac, and I felt like I just assumed that was the only voice this guy could do. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, it reminded me of the way that Phil Lamar can change his voice. There are times yeah. where. Once you recognize that it's him or you know it's him, then you can pick it out. Mm -hmm. But Phil Lamar has that ability, and ironically, Phil Lamar ends up doing Steele's voice for Justice League Unlimited. But he has that innate ability to be able to change it enough where... It's a different. It's a completely different character because Calabac's voice is so easily recognizable. But I, th- I think you're right. I think he does a he does a great job, and and that's a that's certainly a compliment to him that he could change it enough to not sound immediately recognizable. Absolutely. And then some of the other uh, guests we had, we had Cynthia Gibb, who's as um, Mrs. Mills, uh, the the sergeant's wife. Um, she probably most famously was on the television show Fame in the '80s. Um, Before- probably both of us were born yes definitely um i had never heard of it but it was on for five years so i'm sure someone listening has heard of it anyway uh i think sh- she's fine as like the the doting housewife we don't get a lot with her she does, yeah, they don't she's kind of there to just move the plot along that they, they have the scene between her and and uh sergeant mills where he's just completely goes unhinged when he finds out he's been put on uh administrative leave and uh Speaking of Sergeant Mills, we have Xander Berkeley, uh, perhaps most famously from Terminator 2, or perhaps from uh, the TV show 24, plenty of other actors, Great, a great character actor, I believe he's done some other voice work as well, 
uh, playing uh, the the titular uh, of the episode, pro- the prototype, which I guess is his villain name too. We don't ever get like an official name, but uh, yeah. Sergeant Mills slash the prototype. There you go. So uh, I think he does a pretty good job. Yeah, he's fine. Um, there's some scenes where I thought he was a little too monotone, but then the scene where he just goes crazy and starts throwing stuff and breaks his television and stuff, I thought he was really good in that scene. And I thought he was good in his interactions with uh, Luthor and Superman towards the end. And then, yeah, wrapping up, we have our, our regulars, Brief, Dan Delaney. But uh, for the most part, uh, other than our guest characters, it's uh, Tim Daly as Superman and Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor. I think Clancy as Lex Luthor, as we mentioned in plot, is uh, he's one of the best parts of the episode. Oh, for sure. It's it's a very understated. He's in the, the very beginning at the press conference of... of showing off the suit, answering back and forth with Lois. And then, of course, also his scene where he performs that of uh, Brute, or Brute, <laughs> if you will, to, to the prototype Caesar, stabbing him in the back. So very, very good. Very strong performance from Clancy. Always good to hear his performance again. And, and certainly a highlight of watching these Superman episodes is hearing him. So whenever we get him on an episode, it's uh, it's going to be a good day. What, what did you end up giving for a score? So I gave voice acting an 8 out of 10. Uh, I think it's very, very strong. Um... Like I said, I didn't think Xander Berkeley was perfect as uh, as the villain of the show, but I thought he was was good enough. And then on the strength of of Clancy Brown, I thought Tim Daly does a good job. He doesn't have a ton of dialogue in this episode. It's mostly Superman reacting to everything that's kind of going on around him. There's not a lot of Superman in this episode. Yeah, he kind of just shows up. I mean, like like we said, he saves saves the day with uh, with the prototype at the beginning of the episode, and then kind of shows up to fight him at the at the end um and there's a little bit in between but it's mostly shown from the point of view of of sergeant mills so it's it's kind of that's kind of an interesting story device too and a little bit of lex and and john henry irons as well so superman's kind of almost a a secondary character in this episode but i think he does a you know yeah always reliable pretty much uh you know with tim daly superman so his scene at the end with with John Henry Irons, where he talks to him and uh, you know about the suit, I thought was was great. It was good. Yeah. It was clearly this is season two, so Tim Daly's really found a stroke of, of being Superman, not as wooden, showing some emotion, some warmth mm-hmm. towards uh, you know encouraging John Henry Irons to to possibly work on this suit. He, he even makes a little joke about how how it would be nice to have some help around yeah. helping out. So uh, that that I thought was was great. I you ready for this? Yes. I also gave voice acting <laughs> an eight out of ten. So, so for only the second time ever, yeah, well, we, for the first time, and I mean for the second time within the last month. Yes, we had for our four main categories, we had the exact same four numbers. That's oh, but I hear the bonus score sound, Lamb. So that must mean you have a bonus point. That is correct, Cal. And my bonus point is four, as we've talked about a little bit throughout this episode, I just love that they gave an entire episode of to set up John Henry Irons becoming Steel. I love that it's not just he just shows up and he's Steel immediately, or they try to like introduce him and make him Steel in the same episode, because I yeah. think that would be a lot to try to cram into one episode. So I, I love that they gave him that ex, uh, basically an entire episode that's kind of a prologue to his later appearances, as you mentioned, comes back in Justice League as well. Uh, so I really love that this is like a... The, and the little teaser at the end, as you, as you mentioned, of Superman being like, hey, if you ever get that suit working, it would be great to have somebody else out there with me. Like, And then, you know, he kind of you know, starts thinking and, and about it at the end of the episode. I think, I think that's really well done, and I, I love that they kind of gave you an episode to learn a little bit about who he was, and, you know, that, that he's the scientist, that he created the suit, and that he... Uh, uh, but that he's also a good man and didn't want to see it abused by you know someone like Lex Luthor either. I I concur with you. That's a that's a great bonus point. And that will bring us to our final scores, which means with my extra bonus point, I have a final score of twenty eight out of forty. There we go. All right. So that must mean, based on my score, I have a score of twenty seven out of forty. 
So not bad. Uh, those are yeah. those. It's not quite the upper echelon, not the best of the best. But let's talk about watching this again. Recommendation. I think so. We kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, I think if you're just looking for a good episode of Superman, it's a yes. Mm-hmm. And if you want to know more about some of those characters that show up in Justice League Unlimited, like Steel, I think yes. I don't think it's a must must watch, but I I would give it like one thumb up if that makes sense. Yeah. It's a recommended if you're looking for a good Superman episode to watch and you don't want to just pick any of the Batman episodes or right. any of those other episodes that that you were immediately drawn to. If you're looking to a, a, to see a more obscure episode that maybe you didn't see a whole lot or you don't think about watching, yeah, go ahead and watch it. But it it's not pivotal, seeing as how you have a whole other episode that introduces Steel, the character. Right. You don't, It's not necessary, but if, it's not bad to watch if you want to watch the two of them together. Yeah, you know, make it a make it a forty minute episode because it is two episodes later where they they introduce Steel right. itself. So, yeah, I, I would agree. It's not a must watch, but I would yeah, I would pop it in there. Go ahead and watch it. It's not a skip. Yeah, definitely agreed. And that'll bring us to the end of the show. Thank you for listening. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at DCAU Review. Always love hearing about what you think we should do next, what you think of the episodes that we're reviewing every week. And Cal, if you could, give our listeners a little preview of what's coming up next week. That's right, Liam. We are staying here at, for the duration of the month of October, right in Metropolis. But uh, what, if, what if we took a small side trip to Smallville next week? How Always hold on to that? Smallville. Right? I mean, big. you're a big Smallville fan yourself. No, we're not talking about the live-action Tom Welling series, which of course... Not yet. Not yet, anyway. But we, what we are indeed talking about is a little trip to the episode New Kids in Town. Of course, that is the... Legion of Superheroes episode. Liam, Legion of Superheroes coming back in the main continuity of yes, the DC sir. Comics continuity. So, uh, yeah, I think it's good time that we revisit this episode. It'll be good to visit young Superman, young Clark Kent. Actually, I don't think there's any. I don't know if there's any Superman in this episode, but we'll we'll be sure to find out. But yes, look, look for that coming up next week right here at DCAUReview.com or wherever you stream us. Yep, so thank you very much for listening this week. This was episode 74. And until next week, I'm Liam. And I am Cal. And we'll see you on the next episode of the DCAU Review. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.